Hello, and welcome back to Drinking About Birds. Uh, I'm going to get into the meat of the episode in just a minute, but before that, I have something that I would like to address. So, before I started this series, I did some preliminary Googling uh, to make sure that there was no one else out there doing this exact thing. Um, basically, I wanted to do something original with this, and I didn't want to be kind of replicating someone else's work. And it has recently come to my attention, and by recently I mean like a week ago, that on the birding website called 10,000 Birds, there is a regular feature written by one Tristan Lowry called Birds and Booze. And the basic concept of that is pretty similar to what we do here. Um, every week he finds a, generally a beer, but sometimes wine and liquors, that have a bird on the label, and he talks about the bird and reviews the alcohol. So, pretty similar. Um, and I was dismayed when I found this out. It was sort of a blow to my ego to find out that what I'm doing here is not as original as I had thought. If I had known about this in advance, it's very possible that I just wouldn't have started this series. I would have said like, oh, well, good for him. Uh, I'll leave it to him. Having found this out now, uh, with a couple of episodes already under my belt, I'm actually inclined to keep going. Um, just because the basic concept is similar uh, doesn't mean that I'm duplicating his work. There are pretty significant differences, I think, in target audience, in format. I mean, this is a different medium. Uh, I'm making videos rather than a written blog. Uh, I think the perspective is pretty different, and that's what it comes down to. I mean, there might be some overlap in what we say about any given bird, but that's just because we're using the same pool of publicly available facts. Um, I'm not that much of a birder, and I never have been, uh, and I think it's doing a disservice to people to act like I am. Uh, my perspective is that of an ecologist who happens to have worked with birds a fair bit. And so I think what I'm going to do going forward is try to keep the focus on the ecology of the bird in question, because that's what I can speak to most credibly, and that's what I'm most interested in, and if you're interested in that too, then uh, I encourage you to stick around, and if you're more interested in the birding side of things, then you know now that there's an outlet that you can go to uh, for that instead, so, um, yeah. Mr. Lowry, if you ever see this, uh, I apologize for unintentionally stepping on your toes if I have, but, uh, yeah, I think there's room for both of us in this marketplace of ideas, and uh, I guess that's all I have to say about it for now, but um, yeah, if you're here, thanks for watching. This week, we have this wine from Thirsty Owl Wine Company, which is in the Finger Lakes region of New York. Uh, this particular one is called Red Moon. It's a red blend, and it is decorated with a really beautiful illustration of what is unmistakably a great horned owl, and I said right in the first episode that we were going to get into owls because they're very well represented on wine labels and this is probably the first of many examples that I could have chosen but I don't know the reason for that by the way. The important thing is that there's lots of owls and owl themed wine to choose from and they are very cool birds so I'm excited to get into this. Um, so what are owls? Owls are an order of birds that are mostly nocturnal, uh, that varies from species to species. They are universally predatory birds. Uh, some of them are more insectivorous and some of them take vertebrate prey. Um, owls look kind of superficially different from a lot of other birds. They have a different posture and they have this sort of blobby shape to them. Uh, if you look at the skeletons of owls, they are remarkably similar to other birds apart from the skull, which has to have been modified to make room for their gigantic eyeballs, but uh, apart from that, they look pretty much like other birds at the skeletal level, and the difference in shape is really down to this very thick coat of very fluffy feathers that they have covering their bodies. They all have uh, big sharp talons on their feet, they all have this hooked bill for uh, tearing into prey, and they have a lot of adaptations that are, make them optimized for hunting at night. Not a lot of birds out there are nocturnal, and I think kind of an obvious explanation for that is the fact that birds are very dependent on flight as an adaptation for finding food, for escaping from predators, and flight is just inherently more risky 
in the dark. It's kind of hard to see where you're going if there's not a lot of light. Uh, and owls have adapted to these circumstances by having much better uh, night vision than most birds and indeed most animals. And that helps them get around in the dark. And they also have much better hearing than most animals, which helps them to actually locate prey. They have some adaptations uh, to improve their night vision. So their eyeballs are less round and more tubular than the eyeballs of most vertebrates. Uh, they're kind of optimized for gathering as much light as possible and for detecting as much of it as possible. And they have a very high density of rod cells in their retina and a fairly low density of cone cells. And what that means is that they have excellent light sensing ability, but it's mostly monochrome. They lack the ability to distinguish color as well as we can. They also have this membrane in the back of their eye called the tapetum lucidum, uh, which is Latin for bright carpet, which I love. Um, but that is a retroreflective membrane. So it's reflective in that it reflects light. Retroreflective means that light is reflected back along its original path. And this membrane actually sits behind the retina. And what that means is that light passes through the retina. The retina is translucent and it hits this membrane it is reflected back along its original path and it hits the retina again and so the retina basically gets two passes at every photon that goes into the eye uh, and so it just amplifies the effect of what light is present. Owls also tend to have extremely acute hearing. They can hear the same range of frequencies that we can um, but they're just much better at picking out faint and distant sounds and there are some species that can actually hunt and locate prey in total darkness, which is kind of nuts. Many owls have this characteristic facial disc, which is uh, an arrangement of feathers on their face that sort of acts as a parabolic reflector. It helps to channel sound uh, to their ear openings. They can kind of adjust the shape of it to focus on closer or more distant sounds. The facial disc is also shared by some other raptors, uh, particularly harriers and they also use it to find prey by sound, but uh, they're not nocturnal. Some owls, the placement of the ears on the side of the head is actually asymmetric, and that just gives them better ability to discriminate where sounds are coming from, and that gives them an edge in locating their prey. Their feathers also have kind of a different texture than other birds. Their feathers feel almost velvety, and that is a difference in structure that helps them to fly silently. The feathers at the leading edge of the wing also have serrations on the leading edge, and that breaks up the airflow uh, when they're flying, and so it makes their flight more silent. There are about 250 species of owl uh, worldwide. Uh, about 20 of those are found in the contiguous United States. The great horned owl is one of the most widespread of those and it's one of the largest owls that we have, by far the largest owl we have that has these ear tufts, uh, as they're called, and that gives rise to its common name. Uh, these are neither horns, nor are they ears. Uh, they're colloquially referred to as ear tufts, but they're really nowhere near the ears. The ears are on the side of the head. They're actually about level with the beak. Um, they have nothing to do with hearing. They serve probably more of a communication role um, they tend to express the owl's level of alertness or its mood, and so they can play a role in non-vocal communication. You can kind of think of them as similar to how humans have eyebrows, and those eyebrows play a role in communicating. Great horned owls are a representative of the genus Bubo, which is collectively known as eagle owls, and these tend to be medium to large size, uh, fairly imposing and powerful owls. Uh, and there's a couple dozen species of them worldwide. Great horned owls are in many ways kind of the nocturnal counterpart to the red-tailed hawk that we talked about in the first episode of this series. They are a very widespread and very adaptable predator. They are found throughout North America and Central America and a pretty good chunk of South America as well. They inhabit a great variety of habitats. Um, they're associated more with edges between different cover types rather than any one specific type of habitat. 
They are visually quite distinctive, at least among the owls that we have in North America. They are, as I said, one of our larger owls, um, so they're just physically big, uh, and you can identify them almost just based on that. There is a species called the long-eared owl that is kind of superficially similar. It also has ear tufts and it has kind of similar coloration, but it's much smaller than great horned owl, like maybe a third to a quarter of the body mass and uh, significantly smaller dimensionally. So that's the only one that I would worry about mixing it up with. Great horned owls, and this is true of owls in general, but uh, males and females basically look alike in plumage. Uh, they're sexually monomorphic in that respect. Uh, like other raptors, females are significantly bigger than males, but again, that's a tricky thing to apply as a field mark, just because you're not always going to see a male and a female sitting neatly side by side. So again, they're associated with edges between habitats, and that is because they like to hunt from a perch that is adjacent to open space, and so they are generally found in areas where there's a mix of trees and open spaces. They are a pretty formidable predator. Uh, mammals make up about 90% of the diet and the most common prey items are rabbits and hares. Uh, they also eat a number of rodents of various sizes. Um, a smaller proportion of the diet is going to be birds and that mostly consists of waterfowl and uh, galliform birds, so like game birds, like quail, etc. But they're kind of a wild card as far as predators go. They have been documented taking a variety of prey items that mostly don't have to worry that much about predators. Uh, so you just randomly get a great horned owl attacking something that ordinarily you wouldn't expect many animals to mess with. So like the great blue heron that we talked about in the last episode, a uh, pretty intimidating bird for most predators, uh, but great horned owls have definitely been known to kill and eat them. Uh, they will kill and eat other raptors, including other owls, and can actually be a pretty significant source of mortality for those species. In the 1980s, there were reintroduction efforts to try and shore up populations of peregrine falcons that failed because great horned owls kept eating them. Um, and they'll eat stuff like skunks and porcupines that have these really obvious uh, pretty formidable defenses against predators, and it's not like it's a zero-risk strategy. I mean, great horned owls sometimes kill themselves trying to eat porcupines, but the fact is they try, and not a lot of other species will. So just kind of a an element of randomness in what they decide looks like food. My old graduate advisor, uh, who's a big bird guy, would say that if there was a fight between a great horned owl and any other North American bird, uh, your money should be on the owl. They're kind of badasses. They've actually been known to eat uh, northern goshawks on occasion, which goshawks are like the raptors that other raptors have nightmares about. So, um, yeah, very formidable predator, not to be trifled with. They can't even be aggressive towards humans uh, when they're nesting. So if it's like late winter, very early spring, and you see an owl matching this description, uh, maybe just give it some distance. Just a thought. Kind of the, the flip side of that is that they provoke a strong mobbing response in many species of birds uh, and other animals. So. Uh, if they are spotted in the daytime, they will be mobbed and harassed and occasionally attacked by crows, ravens, jays, other passerines, woodpeckers, uh, other raptors. They're just subject to kind of constant harassment if they're visible during the day. And so what they do, and a lot of other owls do this, is they just try and find some place to rest during the day that's very well hidden. So they, they roost in kind of dense foliage where they don't have to worry too much about being bothered. The one time that they are kind of conspicuous is during the breeding season. Uh, this is a very vocal species, uh, depending on the time of year, and you definitely know this call. Again, kind of similar to the red-tailed hawk, this call is used very, very widely in film and video games and 
any other time that uh, you have a scene set outside at night, uh, chances are they're going to use a great horned owl call. Um, so the territorial call is a series of like three to seven hoots in kind of a stuttering pattern. I can try and imitate it. Something like something like that. And this is where males and females are actually pretty easy to distinguish because they are vocally distinct. Uh, males have a lower voice than females despite being physically smaller um, because they have a larger syrinx and because the syrinx is larger it has a lower uh, resonant frequency. So females have a higher pitched voice and with the territorial call they also the pattern is slightly different. They tend to have more syllables and so it's a little more uh, staccato. And this territorial call is used both to establish a territory by the male and then when uh, unpaired individuals want to find each other, uh, they use this uh, to find each other and then when they find each other it becomes part of uh, courtship and they call in what are called duets where they're calling kind of overlapping with each other and it sounds really cool and that is one of the times where you can actually hear males and females calling at the same time and so it's uh, pretty easy to distinguish themselves to distinguish between them in that context. Great horned owls nest pretty early uh, in the season. They start establishing nests uh, early winter and sometimes even late fall. It really depends on the latitude and the climate, so uh, birds that are in warmer climates tend to nest earlier. The male tends to establish a territory by calling sort of around the periphery of it, and he will identify a few potential nest sites within the territory. Uh, once he links up with a female, uh, he will take her on kind of a tour of these different nest sites and show her them. Great horned owls use a pretty huge variety of nest sites, uh, probably more so than any other North American bird. Uh, they don't build a nest out of sticks or anything in the traditional sense. Um, what they do is find either a natural cavity, uh, so that could be a cavity in a tree trunk, or it could be a crevice in some rocks, or kind of a ledge in cliff faces. Um, or even uh, part of an abandoned human structure uh, and they just make a nest there. Uh, they'll usually make some nominal effort to uh, sort of line it with soft material uh, so the eggs have some insulation. But mostly what they do is take over nests that have been actively constructed by other species of birds, uh, often hawks, but also crows, ravens, uh, potentially herons, uh, and they'll even take over nests of squirrels. So squirrels make kind of a nest out of leaves. Uh, great horned owls will take those over uh, without hesitation. And because they nest so early, they usually kind of have their pick and they don't have to actively displace uh, nesting birds to get these structures. But the female will start laying eggs and as soon as she's laid one egg, she starts incubating it uh, and then there will be one or more additional eggs added to that. Um, females do basically all of the incubating uh, in this species, and while the female is incubating, the male will uh, supply her with food. He will go out and hunt and bring food back to the nest uh, so that the female has something to eat. Once the eggs hatch, once there are nestlings, uh, the female will uh, take an equal role in provisioning the nestlings with food. And like the great blue heron, this is a species where there's uh, sort of a lengthy nestling period, it's about six weeks. At the end of that period, the young are able to climb out of the nest, but they're not really able to fly yet, and so they become what's known as branchers, because they're mostly using their legs to climb around on branches and on trees. And they can start attempting flight, but at first they're just really not good at it, and they tire very easily, and so 
over the course of the next like 15 weeks after they can climb out of the nest, they will be making flights of greater and greater duration uh, and at greater and greater distances away from the nest while still being very dependent on the parents for food. And then at the end of that period, they are basically independent and they can disperse and go find uh, territories of their own. Or they might become uh, non-territorial individuals, which are also known as floaters, and uh, they might spend a year or two in that status before uh, picking up a breeding territory of their own. Great horned owls are not migratory in any real sense. Uh, there's populations that live in northerly latitudes that sometimes move south during winter, but it's not every year, and so it's more what's known as eruptive movement. That's eruptive with an eye, and it's just driven by cycles in the abundance of their prey sources. So this particular wine, for once, is not from California. I know we've done a lot of California wines in the past, but that's because California produces a lot of wine, like by far more wine than any other U.S. state and a lot of countries, too. But there are some other states that produce wine, and New York is actually number three. It's after California and Washington, at least in terms of production of grapes. A lot of those grapes are conquered, and they are used to make, like, jelly, and that's fine. But a lot of them are used for wines as well. And the big wine-producing regions in New York are the Finger Lakes region in central New York, the Hudson River Valley, and Long Island. <clears throat> and New York, because it has a fairly cool climate compared to a lot of wine-producing countries, uh, is suited to producing the kind of wines that you see in, like, Germany. Um, so the cooler climate, in theory, uh, makes grapes mature and ripen more slowly, which, in theory, uh, allows for the development of more complex flavors. That's the idea. This particular producer, again, is called Thirsty Owl Wine Company. Uh, it's not a big producer, so I have no idea how widely they distribute, but uh, it's available at the liquor store near me uh, here in the Buffalo area, so I was able to pick it out, and the illustration is beautiful. Uh, it's got this great horned owl like munching on some grapes, which they wouldn't do, but who cares. This wine is tolerable. I don't want to trash it or anything. It's just not my usual taste. It's quite sweet, and I would say there's not a lot of super complex or interesting flavors in it. Um, I suspect it is made of conquered grapes because it does kind of have the taste of jelly to it. Um, I could definitely drink more of it. I don't know that I will. Uh, I might explore some of their other offerings. They have some uh, dry Riesling that I'd be interested to try out, but For now, yeah, I'm just happy to be drinking some wine and talking about birds, so uh, mission accomplished there. I'm out of stuff to say, so uh, thank you for watching. My name is Zach, and this has been Drinking About Birds, uh, and I hope to see you next time.